So um, I'm going to go through a couple of introductory slides, and then uh, Charles will be doing a whole set of uh, very in-depth diagrams that'll wow your socks off. <laughs> so let's say I'm Ali Pruitt, I'm a director of, of storage in Azure at Microsoft, and Charles is a staff engineer at Google. And so who is kind of the Calypter Lock group that we've put together here? We've got Google, Microsoft, Samsung, Kioxia, and Solidime, which all are represented by many people in this room. So, kind of introducing this. Um, we can, we, so security um, at its base is always evolving and always changing, always getting more tough because the adversaries are getting tougher. Um, and one of the things that we wanted to do here with Locke, and it's layered open source cryptographic key management, um, and the idea is to deliver a new open source key management system that kind of gets away from some of the, um, shall we say, lower or, or issues with the security of the keys on devices. So this is scope to, to storage. Um, it is initially starting really, you know, we started with the base of NVMe, but there's nothing really in lock that is NVMe specific. So this also applies to SAS and SATA. Um, and it really provides the key management surfaces that the host needs, both from the user and from the owner of the device, the data center. So, you know, basically the tier one or even some of the tier two uh, hyperscalers are now at a scale where we are very much targets of the nation state nefarious actors, right? And so we really have to go the extra mile for to protect the, our users' data from these sort of nation states that pretty much have unlimited budgets. And with that, you know, we cannot allow the user data to escape ever. We're just, you know, just people would stop trusting us and that would be very bad for business. So. I mean, how can we then provide strong guarantees on the key management in the face of multiple drive implementations and that's opaque inside the firmware, um, where the key might be stored and how you manage the fact that if this key is stored inside the drive and we don't know how it's stored, what happens when we say, yes, please get rid of the key, but how do we know, <laughs> right? So, you know, there all the different, again, all the stuff we're doing for OCP in general, the OCP storage specs and with Calypter and, and with Lock, it's the open standard. Everybody gets the benefit of doing it once and it's not all the, this duplicative effort out there to do all this stuff. And of course, especially in the space of when you're talking about a secure route of trust, trying to fix something like that in the field once you shift is nearly impossible. So, um, they, we had a really big deep dive at this at the, uh, the European Global Summit um, earlier this year, but we want to talk some more of the, the progress and details that we've made since then. So kind of going back to the base on uh, NVMe, the self-encrypting drives, um, you know, say the drive manages the encryption key because we've given it to them. Um, you know, there's granular memories. We have configurable namespace locking is one way of doing it. Um, doing it through Keeper I.O. is another way of doing it. And then doing it through something like range locking is also another way to do it. All different ways of doing this through TCG. And so kind of going back to what Calypter really is about is the idea is it's that open source root of trust for the drive. So it does all of the secure boot needed stuff that we need to securely get that uh, uh, SSD booted and know that we can attest it with the proper firmware and everything's good to go. So now first we kind of, we, when we first envisioned lock, we thought this was gonna kind of be a bolt-on to Calyptra. Um, and then we, when we got into it, we quickly realized that really in a lot of the stuff that lock would need on the side really was already in Calyptra. So we've now done and moved and, and make this as a series, small series of blocks inside Calyptra itself. Um, and this has been approved by the Calyptra TAC and is moving forward for parts of uh, Calyptra 2.1. And so we're kind of, in the end, my kind of portion of the thing is, you know, at this level, security should be absolutely and utterly boring. If it's exciting, <laughs> you've done it wrong. <laughs> right, and so with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Charles.
and he's going to walk you through the implementation. Yep. Um, so just at a top level. Microphone switch there. Um, at a top level, this is kind of your, your high-level components that define the lock architecture. Um, what you see on the right is pre-existing in any NVMe uh, device. You have host software interacting with storage controller firmware. And underneath, you're accomplishing the actual uh, cryptography through some sort of AES crypto engine so that you can achieve this at line speed for performance. Uh, in the green, we have the new pieces that are in being introduced in lock. Uh, Calyptra not necessarily being new, potentially, depending on the implementation. Um, as mentioned here, AES Engine is performing the line rate encryption. Controller firmware manages uh, users and wrapped keys. Uh, and we have base Calyptra here that is providing attestation services for KMB and also provides root secrets for the media encryption keys. And we'll get into what that means specifically uh, in the next few slides. Um, new to this will be KMB. Um, this will take responsibility for generating uh, secure keys and protecting them at rest inside the device. It's also going to enable binding of these media encryption keys to externally injected uh, secret seeds that will provide an additional layer of confidence in terms of avoiding accidental leakages due to implementation issues within um, the storage devices. Um, also introduced with this is a side channel that is directly between the uh, key management block and the AS crypto engine. Um, this will be used to securely communicate the media encryption keys directly to the AES crypto engine, uh, meaning that the controller firmware will never actually see the plain text MEKs, um, therefore minimizing your risk of accidental leakage um, through, through various aspects of the controller firmware execution. Uh, Another important part of this that's going to be to enable utilization of those externally injected secrets is going to be a new feature set that we're going to need to enable multi-party authorization for the MEK access. Uh, part of the model of LOCK is that the privacy of a user's data is a shared responsibility between the CSP and the end user, uh, and each of them is going to want to have a say in whether or not the data is um, exposed on, on the transport protocol. Um, so the, the focus of this particular talk is going to be mostly on the protocol side interactions. There is, in the security track later, um, a more detailed look at KMB itself. Um, but for the rest of this, we're going to focus on the host side interfaces. So one of the key features that we really wanted with Lock is to make sure that its presence was transparent if you did not wish to engage the feature set. Um, so to that end, if you are using the NVMe uh, management protocols, um, everything looks normal. There, there's no extra work that you have to do, format, sanitize, all the other MEK management commands uh, continue to work as defined in the NVMe specification. Um, and there's no changes to the transitions in and out of the locking SP active state. Um, you know, in, in per spec, that means that the global MEK from uh, the NVMe management protocol is stable across the transition into TCG management. Um, what does that look like? Uh, this is just kind of a very high-level block diagram. A lot of this is very hand-wavy because much of it is vendor implementation specific. Um, but this is how the integration kind of looks in terms of MEK derivation. Uh, within Calyptra in the KMB, there is a storage root key. Um, that gets integrated with a KDF into a partial media encryption key. Um, then we have what we have called the uh, data encryption key, uh, and that comes through your, your kind of classical management channels. You can kind of uh, imagine swapping either your key encryption key for uh, the MEK as it exists today, or the MEK itself in as the DEK that gets injected into the key management block that's getting mixed with a KDF to perform the actual MEK. Um, so even when you're using just base NVMe, uh, you've already hidden away the actual MEK value um, so that it's not visible to the controller firmware. It is um, 
being constructed solely inside the uh, Calyptra and then injected straight into the AES engine. Uh, interactions with base OPAL protocols. Um, everything should be manageable uh, with the standard OPAL protocol if you're not engaging any of the lock specific extensions. Um, this is really important. Uh, you shouldn't have to make like a separate manufacturing line just to have lock enabled devices. Um, they should operate normally. You should get some benefits, but not the full benefits if you're not engaging any of the new feature sets. Um, basically, the controller firmware continues to use all the standard Opal admin and user access controls. Uh, nothing's really changing uh, with respect to that if you're not doing anything new. Um, again, looks very similar. Uh, what you're getting in here, of course, is uh, basically the same injection style as the NVMe protocol. Um, but of course, with uh, TCG, you may have local, multiple ranges, uh, namespace with configurable namespace locking. So there's going to be some additional MEK metadata that gets injected in and travels along to the AES engine. Uh, Keeper.io, uh, fully compatible with Keeper.io, even though uh, you won't get, be able to use some of the more advanced uh, key management features because, of course, your key management is now external. Um, but it works exactly the same. Um, and this is even discussed a little bit in the Keeper.io spec, uh, the concept of the data encryption key. That's actually where the name came from. Um, it's very much in keeping with this. It's uh, a transform between uh, what is the externally injected key and then the actual MEK that's used to encrypt in the AES engine. Um, so well, how do we get to, to that multi-party uh, authorization that I mentioned earlier? Um, so reiterating, you know, the data owners, are, which are the CSP customers, your, your VM tenants, et cetera, um, they need strong assurances that their data is not going to be recoverable if the device is ever removed from the host machine, whether that is through being stolen uh, or decommissioned by the CSP. Um, in the current legacy flows, there's a lot of opportunities for errors here. Um, you can have mistakes in controller firmware that can make the secrets recoverable without user passwords. Um, C pins, uh, unless you're, you're going through the secure messaging protocol, those are nominally visible to host software with sufficient privileges, so you have exposures to insider risk. Um, and you can also just have unintentional leakage of any type of secrets, either through logs or crash dumps. Um, so what we're enabling with lock is uh, AES key derivation that is solely occurring within the KMB and can be dependent on values that have never actually been visible to uh, software running inside the storage device. Um, and this is high level overview of how that's going to work. Uh, basically, we have uh, two concepts here. Uh, one is the access keys. These are your external secrets that are controlled by potentially different authorities. Um, and they go through a, a chem encryption process basically to be transmitted uh, directly from the key owner into uh, the key management block inside Calyptra, uh, meaning that these access keys are never visible uh, even to the controller firmware. It's only seeing an encrypted form of them. Um, each of these access keys is associated with a partial media encryption key that is wrapped and stored by the controller firmware. In order to access that partial media encryption key, you must have its corresponding access key in order to go through the cryptographic derivation necessary to get to your partial MEK. Uh, once you have a full set of partial MEKs, they are mixed together with the KDF and your DEK that's coming out of your legacy TCG management flows, and you get your media encryption key that can be injected. Um, to do this, of course, we have uh, some requirements on a new API here, because what I just described doesn't align cleanly with any of the existing um, TCG OPAL API surfaces. Um, so you basically need multiple components to be submitted by different entities with different credentials, and they need to be combined together all at once in order to unbind and use the MEK. Um, so kind of the proposal for this would basically be modeling uh, access conditions, which correspond to these partial MEKs um, as a new object table inside of uh, the TCG OPAL uh, standard and uh, basically enable usage of these conditioned on the access keys. Um, everything else follows fairly standard 
uh, TCG management setup. You have a standard object table that you can reference. Uh, you have standard TCG uh, access control lists that control whether or not you can manipulate specific objects within that. Um, in this, the access condition states get modified by the asymmetrically encrypted access keys, um, which will be used in chem in order to enable us to engage cleanly with uh, post-quantum cryptography. Um, that's in for, uh, very important forward planning as part of this. And um, the access keys, as I mentioned, used solely within the KMB. Um, and in fact, actually, it shouldn't even be visible to the Calyptra firmware. Ideally, this will just be in a key vault inside the key management blocks. Um, so getting very, very strong guarantees about the privacy of the secret information, such that it's only seen inside the key vault, inside of the KMB, and in the original owner. All right, I do not go fast enough despite trying to talk very quickly. <laughs> um, well, the slides are available. You guys can run through. This is just kind of a quick walkthrough of the host contributing their part uh, and the user contributing their part, forming in, finally, the legacy Opal, generating a media encryption key that's injected. So wrapping up, um, we're going to be delivering a common IP block through uh, um, Calyptra 2.1. This is going to help us ensure secure management of the media encryption keys. Um, the 0 0.5, we were targeting to be contributed ahead of 2024 Summit. Look for it later this month. Um, and then if you would like to be involved, uh, please join Chips Alliance or join the TCG Storage Working Group for discussion of the host-facing interfaces. Uh, and also, please come check the uh, deep dive in the security track later today.